And now it is an absolute privilege to introduce today's speaker, the Newbery Award-winning author of more than 40 books for children and teens. His story is about kids who find themselves in a little bit more trouble than they were looking for, or for cats who find themselves in exactly the amount of trouble that they were looking for, have been a gateway to reading for countless young people since the first Rotten Ralph book was published in 1976. And the funny, authentic voices of characters like Joey Pigza have connected to young people who often don't find themselves reflected in the books that they read or are assigned in school. As a librarian, I've met so many kids who don't see themselves as readers, but who will absolutely gobble up the final installment of Joey's adventures, The Key That Swallowed Joey Pigza, which is coming out in September 2014. I can't wait to read it. I am particularly delighted to welcome today's author because we at the library feel a special connection to his work. Several of his books were written right here in the Boston Public Library. It is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Jack Gantos. Thank you. Thank you for the lovely introduction. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Poof. I know. Um, I just wanted to uh, start off a little bit by, by talking about the library and my, my relationship to the Boston Public Library. I moved to Boston in 1972, and uh, I was pretty much broke. But so was Boston. So uh, I lived in a rooming house on Newberry Street for about 16 years. And every day, when I went to Emerson College to get my BFA, BFA in creative writing, but uh, the library there wasn't good to write in. But this was terrific because I would pack a lunch, I would walk over from Newberry Street, I would come in to the Boston Public Library, I would come up the great stairs, I would come up on the left side, and I would leave on the right side. Um, I'd walk under the, the God of Inspiration holding the, you know, the lightning bolts, and I would just go, please give me something. Um, and eventually I got Ron Ralph here. I, I wrote the first Ron Ralph. I wrote, I think, my first 30 books here, sitting in Bates Hall. Seat 37, seat 77, and seat 107. I loved all those sevens. And it was great back then. Nobody was here. It was, to, I know, that doesn't sound right, but you have to understand, I do like quiet. And so... But I was here with some of the most wonderful characters that you no longer see. And I just wanted to, to sort of reprise them. First off, I would go in. You would get here in the morning, like at 9 o'clock. You'd go in. You'd get your seat because you wanted your number seat. You wanted your favorite seat. And so I would go in to 37. I would get it. And then I would look around, and there were all my friends. First off, there would be the professor. He came, he sat there, he never moved. He was the stiffest man, and he always had books on, on trigonometry and calculus. He never read them, but that's what he had. And he would sit there all day. If you fell asleep, they would wake you up and ask you to leave, but he never did. And then there was uh, Mrs. Santa Claus, we called her. That was her nickname around the library, because she, she looked a lot like Santa. And then there was Miniskirt Mary, who wasn't very nice. She would open the books and spit in them. And then there was, oh, there was this wonderful person. And, and I always thought she must have been from Alaska because she would take all the reference books, put them on a table, and mound them up into a giant igloo and then stick her head in there. And she would stay in there all day. Oh, and there was the little squirrel man. He came and he would unpack. He had two big bags. He would unpack um, uh, you, endless amounts of notebooks and pens and paper and paper clips, pile them all up, get his whole desk, I mean, meticulously set up. And then he would take it all down and move to another seat and set it up. And that's all he did all day long. I loved these people. I mean, they... So fabulous, and I was there scribbling away. They probably thought I was one of them, and I'm sure I was. I... 
So at any rate, that was always And the other thing I just want to say is that the children's room was so helpful. Uh, to go in there, to go into the children's room, and there's wonderful librarians, Paula and May, and so many more over the years that were there that led you to every book possible. And I had uh, so many classes. I used to teach at Emerson, and I'd always teach my first children's book writing class would always take place at the BPL, because that's where they had such a rich collection. So I'd bring all my students over, and we'd crawl around in the stacks. People wondered what we were doing there, but we would crawl around in the stacks because they're so low and just pull out all these great books. And it was so fabulous. So the BPL has always been part of my adult life. Really, for about 40 years now, I've been coming to the BPL. So I know a lot about it. And I know something else too, but I'll save it for later. It's kind of a secret that I'll tell you later. But I want to get started on this Lowell lecture because otherwise I will continue talking about, well, adventures at the BPL. Oh, let's move on. Okay. So I thought I would do this. I just thought I would do a kind of uh, navigation of uh, my literary world. So th- I thought I'd start early. That's me in first grade. Western Pennsylvania, Mrs. Niederheiser's class. She taught me how to read. I was most grateful. And I started right off the bat. And you know, nobody really starts off writing. You start off reading. Reading is really the draw. And, and like, like, look at that. I mean, how could you not love a book like that? I mean, where the wild things are. And you, you look up at Max and he's flying down the stairs. He's got that fork in his hand. You know he's going to stab that dog. He never does, but you think he will. And I love Max. You know, Maurice Sendak has him dressed up 90% wolf. That's what he says children are, 90% wolf. And look at Max's self-portrait. It's like, no, move that over to my face. I'm 100% and I'm proud of it. And, and I always love that. And then you have this range of book, and then you have, ah, Lily, Lily's purple plastic purse, you know. And she's so sweet, and when she says, I love school, you really feel it in your heart. Kevin Henke's does great work. And then Miss Viola Swamp from Miss Nelson is Missing. This is Jim Marshall. So um, back in those days, you would, you would find people here doing things that you liked. Jim Marshall used to come here, too. And... Uh, I looked him up in the phone book. He lived on Charlestown, in Charlestown, under the, the monument, right under the, uh, the, the Bunker Hill Monument. So I w- called him up and I went there one day because I was writing terrible books and he wasn't. And so uh, I climbed up there. It was like July. And I was so hot. I was just sweating when I knocked on his door. And he was such a nice man from Texas. And he noticed that I was parched. And he said, would you like a glass of something to drink? And I said, yes, I would. And he brought me an eight-ounce tumbler of scotch. (laughs) And his kindness and his generosity was so great that I had to reciprocate by drinking it. And I never remembered what advice he gave me. (laughs) So then after that, I looked up uh, um, Margaret Ray over in Cambridge from uh, Curious George. She lived right next to the ART theater. And she only drank tea, and so I remembered everything. She said, she said to me, you're not famous. I thought, no kidding, I'm not published. <laughs> and even still, that doesn't mean anything. She said, well, you're famous. I said, well, how will I know when I'm famous? She said, because you never go to the editor's office when you're famous. They come to your house. I was like, oh, that hasn't happened yet. And look, you know, from from Miss from you know Miss Viola Swamp to Lockadow, look how lovely he is. And then Frog and Toad. Arnold Lobel was here. I came here to see Arnold Lobel. He was over in the children's room. So Arnold Lobel was talking about these Frog and Toad books, and I love Frog and Toad. And they were that Harper Harper and Row was not Harper Collins. Harper and Row. I can read, you know, read it myself books, you know, easy reader books. And his editor got up and looked at everybody in the crowd and said, these books are guaranteed to teach your children how to read. We've counted every syllable, the repetition of every word. We've measured the, the, you know, the syntax and the sentence. And she goes on like this. My God, everybody's like staggering beneath that. 
Finally, Arnold gets up and I raised my hand and I said, Arnold, do you, or Mr. Lobel, Mr. Lobel, do you think of that when you write a book? He said, I've never heard of that in my entire life. <laughs> I, he said, I'm just sitting down at my desk writing about a frog and a toad. And then the editor jumps up and goes, no, no, these books are guaranteed. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a snake oil show. No, he was a really nice man, much nicer than I am. So um, I keep journals, and I always have kept journals. And this was just a kind of an early Rotten Ralph idea. And actually, I got Ralph um, from Harvard University. I'd, uh, I'd written a lot of really bad books that didn't get published. Uh, Twelve of them, actually. And um, so I was a little bit desperate, so I thought I should write about a cat because I knew about cats, but then I didn't have a cat, and there was that, you know, write about what you know about and get one. So I answered an ad in the Boston Globe for a used cat, and it happened to be at Harvard University. And uh, so I called them up, and I said, I'll take it. And I went over. I took the subway over. I didn't have a car. I didn't have a cat carrier. I brought a towel which I was uncertain of its use. And, and so I went over to Harvard uh, dorm, one of the dorms for graduate students, and I knocked on the door and they, they um, told me to come in. I went in and they had this cat. And they said, it's a very nice cat. And it was not a very nice cat. It was a really wicked cat. And I wrapped it up in the towel once I got it out from under the bed, and then got on the red line. And you know when you go out of Harvard Square, like it just screeches, right? Like, like this. And that cat started to quiver, and then it just flopped over. And I thought, oh my God, the cat had a coronary. And then, so I'm there holding this U-shaped cat. People are looking at me like, you know, cat aside, I suppose. And at any rate, it only fainted. It fainted. I didn't know a cat could faint. It fainted. And then, uh, and then I wrote about it because it, it really was wicked. And that book turned out okay. So I was very happy. And then it lived forever. It just lived and lived and lived. And finally it passed. And I was telling this story to kids at the school. And one kid said, raised his hand. I said, yes. He said, well, did you stuff it? And I thought, that's a really good idea. Why didn't I think of that? But no, I, I had years before made, see this little coffin I made for him? You open the little fish's head and he's under there? But that book didn't get published. You can guarantee that. And so there he is. So that's the first, that's the first Ron Ralph book. And so that was written here and illustrated by Nicole Rubel, who went to the Museum School of Fine Arts, and published by Houghton Mifflin which uh, in those days was a powerhouse of children's book publishing. It's not quite the same. But at any rate, that's where all of that came from. And then here's the other thing. So you get ideas, right? You, so you gather up your ideas, but then you don't know what to do with your ideas. So, so you have to think of two things simultaneously. While you're sitting in Bates Hall, you know, one hand is working on the creative side and the other hand is working on the structural side. You know, how do you organize all those thoughts? Because you're bombarded randomly all day long with thoughts and you have no idea where they belong, if you're like me. Because I never start with the first sentence first. I have no idea what that magic must be like. So I'm always like looking at like a 32-page picture book. I draw a grid. 16 pages of writing for that, four pages for the beginning, eight pages for the middle, four pages for the ending. In the beginning, what's my job? Character setting problem. Middle is action to crisis. And then ending is look at the character's feelings, solve the problem. And you could think of it this way with corduroy. I don't have a button. I'm looking for a button. I get a bu button. I don't have a pocket. I'm looking for a pocket. I get a pocket. I mean, it's not, terrible. it's not rocket science, really. People think what I do is really hard. It, no. It's just long. It just takes me a long time. And then uh, this is what I do. I put down 16 post-it notes. So then I can, I can quickly edit and arrange those thoughts. And then I type them up because everything looks differently when you type it. It doesn't read the same. And oof, this is what you end up with. And like I'll come stomping home after eight hours at the library. And my wife will say, how was your day? I'm like, oh, great. I got two sentences. 
three, really. No, nope. if you count that as a sentence, then I got three sentences. And it takes me about a month to get it right. About 30, 40, 50 drafts on a picture book usually is about all you need. Okay. So, you know how you read. You start with the picture books, right? And then you start moving into those little chapter books, you know, the, like, the, like the frog and toad ones and Danny and the dinosaur and the Minarak books, the little bear books. And then you begin to move up. And when you move up into like the borrowers, James and the giant peach, Tuck Everlasting, you know, uh, Charlotte's Web. And then you hit Harriet the Spy. And Harriet the Spy just rocked my world. Because Harriet had something that I was doing. So this is my fifth grade journal. So I was one of those kids that got a diary. And I got a diary only because I was kind of bratty. My sister, older sister, had a diary. And I could see the power in the diary. I, didn't, I wasn't thinking about the imaginative world of the diary. I was just thinking about the power because my sister would sit in the kitchen with an open diary and a pen. And when my mother would walk by, my sister would look at my mother and go, "Uh uh-huh, mm-hmm, and write something down. And right away, you know, my mother would be galvanized this and go, what'd you say about me? And she'd say, it's a diary, I'm not telling. And then I'd walk through, and then she'd do the same thing, and my dad would walk through, you know, she'd call him Mr. Big, and she'd write something down, and he'd say, what'd you say about me? And she'd go, it's for me to know and you to find out. And I just thought, my God, my sister has all the power in the house, just simply by this one trick of writing it down. How fabulous was that? I knew how to write. So I asked my mother for a diary, and I got one, but she did make me promise to write in it. And, and I, oh, I was all gung-ho writing. Yes, that's great. So uh, then I got it. I opened it. There are 500 blank sheets of paper in there, and I was absolutely stymied with what to do until I read Harriet. Now, I've always been a person that loves other people's business. And Harriet the Spy is, is really, she's the icon of knowing other people's business. And she walked around New York City spying on people and all of her friends and writing it down in a diary. So I thought I would do the same. So there's my little diary. And that's me. So in sixth grade, I put that book in my bicycle basket and I went around my neighborhood. And I started spying on the neighbors. I love spying on neighbors. It's easy in the city. Just look out your window. So in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, so this was a little neighborhood. Um, This is my house, the Gantos family house. We were the high supervision family in the neighborhood because nobody would ever play here. It was too boring. Um, That's my dog, Bobo, who was eaten, sadly, by an alligator. Um... That's my room, my sister's room. That's my bicycle. You saw my dad eventually ran that over with a truck. I threw up on the wall. Um, And I threw up on the wall because of something really boyishly stupid. Um, You know when you're young, when you're sort of a baby and you're throwing up on everyone and everybody decides, you know what, we're tired of that. So your mother takes you down to the bathroom, points to that white receptacle and goes, look. I'm going to teach you something. When you get ready to throw up, come in here, drop to your knees, slide into position like James Brown, hug the seat, and aim for the middle. You know, so it's a very simple procedure. So um, one night I had eaten too much spaghetti, and I I knew I was going to throw up. So I said, I'm going to go throw up. My mother said, to the bathroom. So I went running down to the bathroom. I slid into position. I put my hands on the seat, and it was still warm. The seat was still warm. And I was like, oh, my God, my sister's just been here. So I, so I came back down the hallway, and I was like, Bleh. and it was like running down my arms. And my mother's like, what, what? And I went, bleh. And, and just like a basketball-sized wad of spaghetti went flinging out of my mouth. And she ducked. I had hit the wall, and uh, it was just magnificent, really. But we never could get the stain off of the wall. We actually painted the wall, and it came back. And, and there was always that faint, vomity smell. You know how Florida is so damp and humid. You'd wake up on a Saturday morning, and you'd be like, oh, the stain is visiting me today. You know, it's like you'd open your window and let it out for a while. Mr. Vellucci built a boat, took a year, launched it, sank in 15 minutes. That was terrible. 
That dog bit me. Um, that was another dog of mine. That's sad, too. We had an airplane crash in our neighborhood, frost and hunts, grumpy old people. They were really grumpy. They were retired st- teachers. And then they had those signs. They were the ones with the signs. Don't step on the grass. Beware the dog. You know how you are when you're a kid. You, you know, you dance on the grass and then you, sit, you start screaming. Send out the dog. And they always have like, you know, a chihuahua or a toy poodle or something. It comes out. You're like, oh my God, it's untying my sneaker. You know, look. Please, I won't do this again. And the M&Ms, uh, I liked them. Last name Metric, seven kids. Michael Metric, Megan Metric, Marshall Metric, Michelle Metric. And then we called them the M&M's, plain and peanut too, melt in your mouth, not in your hand. And then we just lined them up, and for convenience, we named them orange M&M, yellow M&M, brown M&M, green M&M. And that's all we ever called them. So, no neighborhood would ever be complete without the low supervision family. And the Pagoda family was like, a, a, like the most wonderful, dysfunctional family. And I loved them. Mr. Pagoda did not work. He was an inventor. Uh, he didn't invent anything, really. And during 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis, he actually painted an atomic bomb target on his roof. We're 90 miles away from, like, nuclear-tipped missiles. And he goes up to his roof, and he starts screaming, a rant, at Castro. Come on, Mr. Castro, if you're any man at all, wing one of those things over here. So my dad retired military. He was the only thing ballistic. And then Frankie Pagoda, my friend, he had this massive dent in his head because he rode his bicycle down the roof for the pool and missed and just hit the edge. So that was a bad sound uh, when he hit. Um, His little sister, uh, Susie, somebody told her she could dye her hair blonde with bleach. So she stuck her head in a bucket of bleach and it just took straight, it went straight up. It was like Don King's haircut. It just went straight up, and it was bright neon green. And I loved her. She was about this high. She was like a troll doll. You could make a keychain out of her. I broke my brother's arm there for the first time. I did it three times. So this is where I really started to kind of get some sense of purchase on the world around me. I I could begin to see stories that were really interesting, that things would happen, and there was stuff between the cracks that you weren't either supposed to see or supposed to write about, and that really thrilled me. Then the journal came secret, really juicy place to capture ideas, and that's what I was set on doing. And then I would close in on the house. You know, and then I found the watch. I led to trouble. Zippy the roach, my sister was sleeping. And with her mouth open, I dropped a cockroach in her mouth. And she locked me naked outside of the house. And I had to run around the house and hide in these bushes until my dad came home from work. And he drove up the driveway and naked, I jumped out in front of the car. I thought he was going to run me over. It was just wonderful. I had this wart. I pulled it off with a pair of rusty pliers. It was a planter's wart. And I got infected. My foot turned into like a canned ham. And I didn't tell my mom for the longest time. And finally she took me to the emergency room and made me confess to the doctor. And and when I did, my mother looked at the doctor and said, I'm so sorry. She said, this is my my son. He is the stupidest boy in the world. I was like, thank you, mother, for supporting me on that. But once again, you know, you get these ideas. Like, stuff is going on all the time. What do you do with it? Well, you could write it down, but it always comes out uneven and disorganized. So, as a kid, I started like, okay, let's try and get some sense on this stuff. So, even as a kid, I was looking at how structure went together with content. So, no matter what I was putting together... Um, I would try and get some beginning, middle, and end to it. And in the beginning, character setting problem, just like a picture book, action, crisis, and then resolution, physical and emotional ending at the end. And then in my journal, I would just keep long lists of possible story ideas. And then I would match the list to the maps and start looking for, for, for pieces. And then later on, when I got a little, a little more sophisticated, like where you see the physical ending, where it's always looking for that emotional ending. Like, 
I would go back and I would redraw the maps and then with each physical item, then I would write a strong emotional word under it so that you could tell emotionally what the theme was as well as physically what the plot and the story was. And so I would do that. And that way I could begin to see some layers in a story. And then I wrote, um, I wrote five volumes of, of stories. Fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. Those journals are fabulous. Anybody who, that you know, went through their adolescence and got really you know, sort of overly sensitive and then threw their journal away or burned it in the fireplace, that's too bad. Because those things are fabulous. Sam's getting a little older, a little smarmier looking. And then we moved to Barbados. This was great. My mother was arrested for murder. That was a terrific time. Um, my dad gave her a pistol. This, you know, this never should have happened. So I gave her a pistol and she went, he took her shooting at this abandoned horse race track, pitch black. Next day, the newspaper headlines, man found shot dead at racetrack. So my mom goes, oh my God, it's a man must have been walking across the track and I shot him. And my dad's like, nah, it wouldn't have happened that way. And my mom's like, what do you mean it wouldn't happen that way? I'm the only idiot out there in the middle of the night with a handgun firing it off. I'm going to call the cops. My dad goes, don't call the cops, he's already dead. <laughs> well, you know, this is taking place in front of the kids, right? You know, morals, values, ethics, you know, that's how I weigh that in front of the kids. And then... So finally, my mom pointed to the kids and said, see these children? I'm going to do the right thing. She called the police. They came and arrested her for murder. Took her away for three days. She was gone for three days till they did the ballistics test, and the bullet in the guy didn't match the gun. He had been shot there, and his body had been dropped, dropped there by coincidence. I mean, that was a pretty close call. My dad had, uh, you know, cockfights. My dad had a fighting chicken. We owned one. And uh, well, I remember when he brought it home, brought it home in a big sack, burlap sack. He was jumping around in there. I was like, what's in the sack? He goes, let me show you. He dumps this chicken out, right? The meanest chicken I've ever seen in my life. It was black with a green head, and it chased everybody in the house into the kitchen. And we we're trapped by a chicken in the kitchen. It was just pecking away at you like this. You know, don't you dare move. It was like a herding chicken. And... Eventually, went to the, we went to the cockfights. It was just awful. Just a, really a bloody mess. We all walked back pretty depressed. I wrote about that. Oh, and then these books. So Joey pigs us. So I, I thought, well, I'm tired of writing about me all the time. Because I sort of am like Rotten Ralph. And then I am, sort of, I am Jack Henry. So I thought, well, I'll write about other people. So I was speaking at a school... Oh, good. I was speaking at a school, and uh, there was a great kid in the front. I was like in a room like this. There was a kid right there. You know those unibody desks in school? Like they weld them together. Like they're not two pieces anymore. It's one solid unit. And the kid had his foot in somehow behind the chair, and he was spinning around like it was a universal joint. He could just like woo, whip around. And he was so smart, I would say something, I'd say like half a sentence, he'd finish it. I would set up a, a joke, boom, he had the punchline. I was like, I love this kid. And so after a while, I'm just sort of like tailoring the entire talk to this one kid. The rest of the kids are sitting there, they're patient, and he is having a blast, spinning in a circle. Finally gets a really, really nervous looking, and he starts trying to get his teacher's attention over in the corner, and she's dealing with some other belligerent child, and then... Um, and then finally he just screams out, teacher, teacher, I forgot to take my meds. <laughs> and, 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 and she just pointed to the door and that kid just shot like a frozen rope choo, right down the hallway. And you could hear him punching the lockers all the way down. Bam, 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 bam. You know, giggling about it. And I was like, whoa, that's a great kid. But he was gone, so he was gone. So that night, I was in Pennsylvania. I was uh, in Lancaster at the Buchanan School. Yeah, next to Buchanan Park in fine downtown Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And uh, so they moved me. I was going to speak at another school. And so they put me in a motel called The Willows. And it was actually a truck stop with like three rooms attached to it. And, and it was kind of funky. 
and I called it the Willies. And so you go in, and like some totally OCD person was working there because everything had a ripped piece of paper on it, like a little ripped piece of paper, and, said, and taped on to every item. So it would be like, don't steal the lampshade on the lampshade. Don't steal the rug on the rug. Don't steal the towel on the towel. Every item, you know, had a don't steal this item on it. And I thought, oh my God, this is like psycho. Here I am. I'm like, how many locks are on this door? I'm checking the windows. I'm like, okay, relax. There's a lounge. There's, you know, like the trucker's lounge is just down the sidewalk. I'm like, are you kidding me? I'll be, I'll be you know, cut the ribbons down there. So, so I thought, stay in the room. That's a good choice. Stay in the room. Do something. I thought, well, I'll, I'll write in my journal. You know, there's a way to concentrate. So I pull it out and I start writing about that kid. And I was like, yeah, that's got some traction. Next day, he was still the most interesting thing. And he was still the most interesting thing. And then it took off. And then, and here was kind of a real pivot point for this book because I first started to write it in the third person. And he did this, and he did that, and his meds, and his ADHD, and so on. And, and suddenly, I, I, I got about, I don't know, 90 pages into it. And then I could just feel that distance between the writer and the character. And if I could feel that distance, I thought any kid would feel that distance too. And so then it reminded me a lot of those books that we would get in school. We called them disease du jour books. You know, there was always a book for any disease or any terrible situation. You know, my dad, who we visit every Sunday in the penitentiary. I mean, there was a book for that. And, and so, and so um, I thought, oh, God, I've ruined this book. I've fallen into the worst possible trap. And then I thought, okay, let me just try and rescue it for one moment and flip that voice from third person to first person. And the moment I flipped that voice, then his voice turned on behind there. And then that book was just smooth sailing all the way through. That was good. So now he owned it. It was his feelings, his world, his thoughts, his choices. And he was not a hand puppet out here doing things that only I wanted him to do. He wanted to do them more than I did. And so I wrote that book. And that book took off. It still has taken off. And then, same structure. Like, so it's a novel. Now we're not dealing with a picture book. We're not dealing with a short story. A novel, same darn construction. Characters, Joey and his family, setting Lancaster, Pennsylvania, home and school, problem, very active child, situation so active, he begins to make bad choices. Action, in the middle. First one sticks his finger in the pencil sharpener, gives it a crank. You know where I got that idea? Right in Bates Hall. Remember those great old Boston pencil sharpeners? They had them by the windows, right? And you would go over there and they had the adjustable faces on them and have for skinny pencils and for really thick pencils. And I was using a pencil writing this book. So I walked over to sharpen it and I was like, that's a cool sharpener. And then I dialed it to a big hole and I stuck my finger in it. And I thought, this is fabulous. Let me see what happens. And so... So I gave it a little crank and I could feel the blades come down around my finger. And I thought, okay, I'm Jack. I'll just pull my finger out. But if I was Joey, I would just like, "Mm," give it a really good crank. And that's what he did. And he took his fingernail off like shelling a shrimp. Then the second action, playing with his house key on his string, swallows it, pulls it up. Swallows it, pulls it up, swallows it, teacher cuts the string, comes back with the same key the next day. Anybody want to sniff this? And then the third action jumps out of barn, twists his ankle. Fourth action builds up to the crisis. So you're just staggering that action like, you know, you're spinning plates out there. And then finally, running with scissors, trips, cuts off Maria's nose tip, just a little bit of it. But somebody's been hurt, so he's taken out of school and he's given the help he needs, the care and love and support he needs for the double ending. Physical ending, returns to school, in control of himself, and then emotional ending because he's in control. He knows he won't be committing, you know, sort of disastrous acts. He'll be making good choices. Once again, same structure. You just have to kind of walk yourself through it. And it does help you when you're working on a book and you get stuck. You can always ask yourself, the structure is going to shine light on where you should be within that book. So it's a, it's a handy little tool. It's not genius, it's just basic. 
And then I did another one. So now I did... Oh, I love this. Like this, this was one of the paperback covers. And kids would come, come greet me at school like this. And, like, and he'd come running up. Like this kid came running up to me and said, Take a picture. So I did. And he said, I'm Joey. I'm like, no kidding. And <laughs> I love that. But they've discontinued those covers. They're all now this which I love this. Lane Smith has re-jacketed all the Joey Pigs of books and this is the one coming out in September. So I just finished this uh, two weeks ago and now uh, I've been in the library this week. I was here yesterday, today, uh, working on the next novel, which is a complete muddle. I have no idea what I'm doing. And then, um, yeah, and then I wrote this book, uh, dead end in Norvelt. I'm from Norvelt, Pennsylvania, Western Pennsylvania, a fine town named after Eleanor Roosevelt. Oh, I always start. I always handwrite my books, so I'm, I still work in journals. So I, I draw out a title page and I, I treat my journals like it's a like it's a one edition. And see, Norvelt, we have our own little sign, started 1934 for out of work coal miners and farmers. You know, during the Depression, there she is, St. Eleanor. We love her. And as my grandfather, 50 years later, me. You know how they always say you're standing on somebody else's shoulders? No kidding. Out there, you definitely are. Because I wasn't digging any coal. In fact, I went into the mine. I was like, oh my God, this is really not good. And then you hear all those rats scurrying around. My uncle took me in. He said, oh yeah, that was my job when I was a teenager. Rat killer. I said, what do you mean? He said, they gave me a 22 and I would walk around all day shooting rats. I'm like, wow. It's bagging groceries. I'm like, were there people working here? He's like, yeah, you know, you just don't want the bullet to ricochet wrong. I'm like, so he must have been a great pool player, you know. At any rate, so it's nice to be standing on my grandfather's shoulders. He was a great guy. And this is where that book takes place. This is my house in Norvelt. We don't own it anymore. We sold it. This branch wouldn't be hanging there like that because my dad would have cut that off or he would have thrown me up there and I would have cut it off. And then uh, I was standing on a picnic table right here and I was watching a movie at a drive-in theater about two miles away on a hill and um, I was using my dad's uh, World War II Japanese binoculars that he got in the Solomon Islands and I knew he had a Japanese sniper rifle in a box right there. And I thought, that's a great prop. It was like Wake Island. It was, the movie was like the Battle of Wake Island. And I'm like, whoa, this will be so cool. So then I pulled the trigger, and it fired. And my mom was here. She screamed. I screamed. Blew off of the table. And I crawled under the table. And when I, when I get really overly nervous, I get these wretched nosebleeds. And I was just covered with blood. And my mother picked me up by the ears like a rabbit. And she went, oh, my God, you shot a hole in your face. And I, was, and I looked at my mom, I'm like, will I live? And she didn't answer. And I was like, oh, that's not good. And then she had her dish towel with, with her, and she wiped my face off. And then she went, oh, it's just your nose. You're grounded. <laughs> so that's what I was shooting at, the Viking Drive-In Theater. And that's from my journal, my little bloody nose drawing. And this is like my room, the most boring boy's room in the world. It, Probably boy slash nun. And <laughs> I never slept on the bed. I slept under the bed. You know that fight you have every morning with your parents? How to make the perfect bed? I mean, really. It's no wonder I ended up in prison. It continued. It was like it was the same bed issue all over again. So, um, so I was in that room. There's nothing to do in that room. So my mom had done uh, work for the Heckler, Pub- Heckler Library that went out of business. And she took the 250 landmark history books, brought them into my room. And this is quite a coincidence. And I built an igloo out of them. Maybe, is she still there? And she, the igloo lady. And uh, I built an igloo and I would sit in there and read them. And this is when I started thinking about history and beginning to do something that I probably wasn't supposed to do, which was have empathy for the enemy. 
And I remember that was such a thing that was so taboo to feel badly about. I mean, you feel good about this, and then you go, oh, that's weird. You know, remember the children's crusade? Nobody had a good answer about what happened there. It was like, oh, they got on a boat, they went over there, we never saw them again. Like, oh, but they're in heaven. And you're like, oh, really? <laughs> I think they're chopped up. And then, uh, you know, they show you this cover, but they don't show you down here. You know, they don't, they don't show you Tokyo. They don't show you the 100,000. So, you know, things like that. And I began as a kid having like a secret life as well. That, that reading books would give you, especially history, would give you a larger sense of the world. And you begin to get isolated within your own empathy and within your own perception of the world around you. And it was very hard to have a conversation with my father, who was in World War II, about empathy for the enemy. He no empathy there. He was out then. Here's my mom cooking the baby. It's very nice. <laughs> Western Pennsylvania. It was like Cormac McCarthy's The Road before, you know, before it was even conceived. Gardens out there. So Norvelt was built on the Jeffersonian plan that every house had to have enough garden space to uh, grow their own crops in case there was a depression. You could feed your family. It was a very nice idea. Hamilton, of course, opposed that sort of thing. He wanted the you know, he wanted money. He wanted the federal government to have a bank. Everything be commerce. At any rate, I got out of my room by going down to Miss Volker's house. This, like, this older lady who had been hired by Eleanor Roosevelt to be the nurse of the town. And she was fabulous. She was an old IWW wobbly. She could have given, like, Howard Zinn lessons. You know, and... And I loved her. So when I started talking about the history with her, then she really started to explain all of that, you know. And especially coming from Norvelt, which was a working community. And then I typed up the obituary. She was also the obituary writer, and she had bad arthritis. She'd write obituaries like this, you know. Why should, why should the church get in the way of love, you know, where you have a Protestant cemetery and a Catholic cemetery and a mixed marriage? And so they would get all the plots next to the walls so they could be close to each other. I mean, it's just amazing, isn't it? I did needlepoint for her. I love needlepoint. That and a little history just keeps me occupied for hours. And every town has a town busybody. And then, oh, we had the Hells Angels move into our town. And then that gave me a nosebleed, too. <laughs> but I have to say one good thing about the Hells Angels, and then I'll move on, is... Uh, is they had a clubhouse, and during Halloween, when you would go to the Hells Angels clubhouse, it was the best Halloween place because they would be all dressed up, and like a guy, like a Viking, a giant Viking, would jump out on the front porch, and you'd look up at him, and you'd go, trick or treat, you know, and then he'd say, repeat after me, and he'd say, yeah, and he'd say, I'm going to be a bad when I grow up, you know, a... Starts with A. And then, uh, and then I would repeat, I'm going to be a bad, starts with A, when I grow up. And uh, then they'd give you a beer. <laughs> Unbelievable. I'd go home, my dad would go, were you at the Hells Angels Clubhouse? I'd go, yeah, he's go, let me see that bag. You know, bring the real candy, dead candy. Um, typewriter collection, Girl Scout cookies, horses. That's my dad in his airplane. He disliked Norvelt so much, he bought a J3 kit at an Army-Navy store, built it in the garage, had some guys help him put the wing on, and he flew away from Norvelt. Amazing. In fact, they banned him. He used to land on the ball field. I was in the outfield, and he landed the plane in the outfield, chased all the ball players around and took off over the fence. He had it with him. Just what he wanted. I remember I was reading this book. My dad came in. This is like dad pop quiz at my house. You're holding the cover of this book. My dad goes, which guy are you? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. Well, obviously, there's a right and a wrong because it's my dad. You know, he's got opinions. So I thought, well, take the guy with the flag, right? I remember I picked the guy with the flag. He goes, no, you don't pick the guy with the flag. Get the guy with the gun. The guy with the flag is going to be on the ground in a minute. You know, no, it's, <laughs> Oh, he's getting the wrong guy. <laughs> There's no winning. That's his favorite book. Then that's my birthday gift. 
because we were building a bomb shelter. Remember those bomb shelter movies? They, they, you know, like these fake, remember these fake towns they had? And they'd show them school as a kid, and then they'd do this, boom! And then <laughs> this would be what's left of it. And then they would, and then they're like, this is going to happen in the United States. You'd be like, oh my God. You know, and it was like 62, you know, which was a bad thing for bombs. And then, oh, yeah, I started driving at 11 and then uh, dressing up as a grim reaper, knocking on people's doors, asking if they're going to die anytime soon so we could write their obituaries. And then there was, well, I had to have a plot. And some other people did too. And then, um, so this is Norville. These are the town. This is the town. There are 250 of these little houses. And there's a community farm, community factory. And that's what it looks like on the half my family didn't live in. Because on my side, there's uh, now, uh, well, trailer homes and, uh, and lots of fast food restaurants. They just built a, a Subway sandwich shop next to my uncle. I think he likes it. It's convenient. And look at that dead end sign. Oh, come on. That's a good one. Okay. Let's leave Norbelt. Oh, yeah. Forget about that. Oh, that book. So, that is my mugshot. So, before I arrived and paroled to the Boston Public Library, um, I was living in Florida, back in Florida. Uh, and then I graduated high school there and I was supposed to go to University of Florida and I wanted to go for creative writing, so I drove my car up to University of Florida and they said, we don't have any creative writing here. Not until your junior year, then you could take a course in like essay writing. And I thought, well, I'm not coming to this school. And I said, besides, it just looks like a giant football stadium with a, you know, institutional tick attached to the side of it. I didn't go. I was so arrogant. I thought, I can write novels on my own. So I was living in a rooming house there. I was living, my senior year in high school, I lived by myself in a rooming house on Broward Boulevard. And uh, at any rate, so um, I started writing bad novels and uh, couldn't do that. And then I moved to St. Croix where my parents were and that wasn't going well. And then I was broke and I knew I had to get out of town. And then I met this really nice British guy who said, I've got 2,000 pounds of an illicit item on a wonderful yacht and I'll give you $10,000 if you sail it with me to New York City. And I said, yes, 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 this is fantastic. Thank you. I was so beholden to him. I was like, oh my God, my luck has changed. I get on a boat. I didn't like that he was naked with a gun the whole time, but at any rate, we sailed across the Atlantic. I didn't even know how to sail. I learned while I was out there on the job training. And then, uh, and then we ran into New Jersey, and then we crawled our way on up to Manhattan, and then a lot of people didn't like us, and, uh, and that's where they put me. They gave, I had six years, but I didn't have to do it all, just a year and a half. And then I wanted out. So here's how I got out, and then we'll take questions. So this was like the smartest thing I've ever written in my life. I know it's going to sound smarmy, and I apologize in advance. And that is, when I was there, and I thought, I can't take it any longer. You know, being in prison really is no fun. And, and I read every book in the library they had. And so, um, so I sent away for a college application to a school that looked like it was going out of business. I don't know if you remember Graham Junior College in Kenmore Square. It's no longer there, because it really was going out of business. And I got a, an application... And I filled it out, and on the essay portion, I just wrote, will pay cash. And I was instantly accepted. And I took it to my caseworker, and they actually had the parole board release me right from a prison cell to a dorm room. Same construction. The key was really the only difference, really, in that. Cinder block, cinder block. And... Uh, and then um, I transferred to Emerson College for my BFA in creative writing. So that was, uh, that was it. So that one little phrase, we'll pay cash, has always uh, actually got everybody's attention in my life. So that's where we're going to stop. Oh, one other thing. So you see that. 
See that? That's my senior year picture. I mean, doesn't that look like a nice boy? Look what happened a year and a half later. Oh, God, how does that happen? I don't know how parents endure it. I really don't. Because now I'm a parent, and I look back on that, and I go, oh, my God, it would kill me. I can't stand looking at him. Get that. So, I I managed to get all that in and still have time for questions. So you know that I, I moved too quickly. I had no depth at all to this talk. I just skimmed the surface of everything. So I'm hoping that your questions will um, advance the, the, the discourse that we're trying to start. Oh. Thank you.